scrolling through the internet, there's loads of articles about great anti-piracy measures that messed with bootleggers, slowly degrading the game or making it impossible to beat, and so on. However, what of these anti-piracy tactics have the total opposite effect? Instead of harming the thieves, backfire and actually ruin the enjoyment of the loyal, legitimately purchasing clientele, to the point where it'll literally destroy their computers in some cases. It's rare, but it does happen. So this episode, we take a look at these rebounding, rejecting rapines, these boomeranging, bulky bootleggings, and these counter-problematic plagiarisms. As I say, but hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt, five completely useless anti-piracy measures. Arrgh. As much as the collective internet hates on the console ports of Robocop 3 for its insane levels of difficulty and being, well, let's be honest, crap, the Amiga and Atari ST ports of the game were nothing short of astounding. A 3D open world game in 1991, an entire decade before the industry was heralded in Grand Theft Auto 3 for that same concept. In fact, six years before the original Top Town 2D version was doing it even, was nothing short of groundbreaking back then. Patrolling the streets of Delta City in all its boxy glory was revolutionary for its time. The publishers, Ocean Software, knew they were onto something special with this, so to regain the silly amounts of money they had obviously invested into the title, they obviously wanted to implement some sort of rather tough to crack anti-piracy measures. So to counter any potential lost revenue, the boys from Manchester came up with a rather novel solution. A dongle that you simply placed in one of the joystick ports that the game would check for on startup. No dongle, no game. Simple, right? Well, no. It was bad enough you had to sacrifice using a port to use a thing, but thanks to its idiotic, bulky design, the dongle would only physically fit half the Amigas available on the market at the time. Ironically, and only the base model that ran the game the worst at that. Unfortunately, I only owned an Amiga A600 as a kid, so dumbass me sold a hole in my computer to get the thing to fit as I wanted to play it so much. And it still didn't bloody work! And want to hear the most stupid thing about this whole venture? Ocean had delayed the game so many times to accommodate the dongle's inclusion, that pirates had not only possessed a copy of the game, they had already cracked the anti-piracy measures and released the cracked game publicly three weeks before the game was even released. Ocean soon realised what a pointless measure the dongle was, not only for limiting their potential sales of compatibility, but also that it had already been leaked. So all future revisions of Robocop 3 were made dongleless, opting for the more tried and tested look up a specific word in the instruction manual anti-piracy measure, and Ocean would never use a dongle ever again. Amazingly, other publishers never learned from Ocean's idiocy. Master of Strategy seminal British baseball simulator Cricket Captain also used a dongle as an anti-piracy measure. One does wonder who would want to pirate a cricket game to begin with, but there are some truly sick people out there in this world. Now, there are some anti-piracy concepts that sound ingenious on paper, but completely fall apart in the real world, such as with our first method, the lens lock. First introduced in 1985, the lens lock was essentially a plastic prism that you'd place over an area of the screen, and by looking through it, you'd decode the hidden message in order to unlock the game. 
and with the ability to make almost an infinite number of different prism combinations, he would make piracy borderline impossible. Sounds like the perfect solution, right? Completely foolproof. Well, no. The problem is it only works on a specific size TV. Got a TV too large? Impossible to decipher the code. Got a TV too small? Same deal. And even if you did have that sweet spot TV for a lens lock to work, the manufacturers made multiple variations between games, and even between revisions of the same game. So you'd often receive the wrong lens lock for your game, purely out of their own incompetence. And let's not forget television's only output in RF at the time, making trying to read the code on a blurry, unstable image a pain in the first place. So you can see why the whole affair was dropped after only 11 titles. It didn't really take much to qualify as a simulator back in the 80s. Whether you wanted to emulate the dizzying speeds of a Formula One car, or just mowing the lawn, sticking simulator at the end of any old crap made it sound a lot more glamorous than it actually was to punters. And no one was more infamous for this than Codemasters, whose pretty much entire library consisted of simulator this or professional that when they combined both proclamations with Professional Skateboard Simulator. The isometric slash top-down racer that didn't know if it wanted to rip off 720 degrees or skate or die more. So why not both? Anyhow, for some obscure reason, Cody's got it into their head that people wanted to pirate games you could pick up at the newsagent for three quid. So wanted to do something to counter this. But for whatever reason, be it a lack of funds to develop an uncrackable copy protection, or just not really being that arsed, they came up with this. Yup, this is it. Quite possibly the saddest looking code sheet in the history of gaming. They did at least put the text on a dark red background so you couldn't photocopy the sheet, but let's be honest here, it would take you all of two minutes just to jot the thing down anyway. Heck probably just as long to simply memorise it. Needless to say, Codemasters never bothered putting code sheets in any future budget titles. But this kind of genius engineering of theirs is probably what got them bought by EA decades later. A fitting punishment. Rare, or ultimate play the game as they were known back then, were often regarded as a Rolls Royce of gaming in the UK, with innovative original games that oozed quality. One such title was Sabre Wolf, the thrilling adventures of a great white hunter who must fence his way around a garden, killing endangered wildlife to reconstruct the four missing pieces of an amulet. As you do. It was highly praised at the time, being considered the best maze game of 1984 by Crash Magazine, and receiving 9 out of 10s across the board. It was even re-released on the Xbox One in 2015 as part of Rare Replay. Also, the werewolf and killer instinct is named after the game, did ye know? Anyhow, the downside of creating such anticipated software is the inevitability of piracy, and Sabre Wolf was obviously not going to be any exception. Ultimates were already paranoid about losing sales on the game, mainly as the game intended to be Sabre Wolf's prequel, Night's Law, was considered so groundbreaking with its never before seen isometric perspective, they delayed the release of the game for an entire year and shoved out Sabre Wolf in its place, fearing Sabre Wolf would be considered too primitive in comparison and dissuade people from buying it. So, with this neuroticism already in their heads, what was Rare, I mean, Ultimate's idea to deter piracy? An ingenious series of codes? Some hilarious bug that renders a game unplayable? No, far more simple than that. Just make the game 
really expensive. Yep, Ultimate seriously thought that charging nearly double the price of other AAA retail games will discourage owners from making copies for their friends. Bizarrely, it never occurred to them that people would want to pirate the game because it was so expensive. And that's not counting all it takes is just one person to break the loop. Needless to say, Ultimate needn't have worried. Saber Wolf sold over 350,000 copies on the ZX Spectrum alone in its lifetime. Small by today's standards, but considering selling 50,000 copies of a game would be considered a major success at the time, it was massive. But it's just one more way to punish the honest. Our next entry's copy protection was so terrible that it literally forced gamers to download a pirated version just to avoid all the mind-numbing rigmarole you had to go through just to even start the bloody thing. And who published this game? EA. Who else? Now cast your minds back to the heady days of 2008 Spore. Hot off the success of The Sims, Will Wright wanted everyone to become their own Charles Darwin, creating life and seeing it evolve and compete in a universe of infinite other creations. Sounds amazing, but pretty much devolved into everyone creating an endless procession of penis monsters. But with Mr. Wright essentially creating an all new genre, EA knew everyone would pirate the hell out of it so slapped a brand new copy protection system they had just licensed by the name of Securom. With its always online DRM, Securom essentially checks constantly if you're playing a legitimate copy of the game. You know, just in case you felt like removing your official copy halfway through playing and swapping it with a pirate one. As you do. So if you weren't near a phone line connection, not prepared to pay insane early 2000 fees for a constant wireless connection, or just didn't want to be online, then no game for you. And if this wasn't invasive enough, EA also only allowed you to ever install the game three times, just to be dicks. Of course, as per usual EA, all consumers' complaints fell on deaf ears. They weren't prepared to fix a problem you had that they had created. So, ironically, the only option to physically play Spore was to resort to using a pirate copy. Which, doubly ironically, with all the faith EA had put into Securom, had been fully cracked 24 hours before the game was even on sale. So, a combination of this and future purchasers reading the news and not prepared to go through the same BS, EA had inadvertently created the most pirated game of 2008 in a month. In fact, thanks to Electronic Arts' draconian copy protection, Spore would go on to become the most pirated game of all time. The outcome to all of this, and with the mass piracy affecting their profit margin, EA finally responded to the anger and agreed to recant their incredibly oppressive DRM by allowing you to install the game five times instead. Never change, EA. Never change. Hello, you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and until next time, friends... I'm missing you already.